I'd like to start by uh, doing a small experience and bringing you know, everyone into um, my presentation, in a way. So please, um, take a few seconds and have a look at your feet. All of you, please. And observe. What do you see? Shoes, right? Now, second part of the experience, if you can, you can close your eyes or just you know, focus in your mind and try to picture your shoe closet in your mind. You're there? Now, how many pairs of shoes do you have in your shoe closet? Last part of the experience, if you have more than one pair of shoes, raise your hand. Keep your hand up. If you have less, then five pair of shoes, you can lower your hand. Less than 10, you can lower your hand. 25? Be honest. 50? Ladies, be honest. 100? All right, you can lower your hands. Now, the primary function of shoes is Walking? No. <laughs> the reason why, walking is an excuse. The reason why <laughs> you wore those shoes today is because of where you stand in shoe culture. Now, shoe culture is the theme of uh, this presentation, and um, I'm going to try to fit a lot of information into a few minutes. So please bear with me. Um, but before we get into what is shoe culture, I'd like to take a second, a few seconds, to uh, tell you or you know, share with you what, what the effect that it has on us. And so shoe culture dictates what we wear on our feet, when, and for how long. It also makes you believe, or makes me believe, that we have to spend a lot of money on shoes, and we own a lot of shoes. It flatters, increases the length of your leg, makes you appear or feel taller, thinner. It also hurts, <laughs> short term and long term. But the scary part is, most of us don't even know why. And so that's a reflection that, you know, an idea that kind of struck me 10 years ago. And so I decided back then to take a trip into shoe culture and into people's psyche to understand why. And after 10 years, lots of research and two films on the subject, I brought back a few insights. And that's what you know, I'd like to share with you today. Now, first insight, men and women are different. <laughs> I guess you probably would have guessed that, right? Uh, but in shoe culture, it's very important. So I don't have you know, really enough time today to go through every shoe and every shoe culture. So you know, because there's men and women in the audience, we're going to start well, we're going to talk about sneaker culture, as it relates mostly to men, and high heel culture, which is, of course, the prerogative of women. So we'll start with guys because there's less to say. Uh, <laughs> sneaker culture. Well, sneaker culture, interestingly, sneakers were introduced in 1917 uh, to play sports and you know, to play basketball by Converse. That was the first sneaker. But we had to wait until the 70s and the 80s for sneakers to really reach maturity and to go global and to reach fashion in a way. And that's you know, the, first, the first thing to keep in mind. What's interesting is, you know, despite the, the myth about it, it's not athletes that brought sneakers into style and fashion. It is actually rappers and hip hop. And indeed, it is the marriage of basketball and hip hop that created, that gave birth to the sneaker culture as we know it today. Now the first kick, the first sneaker to be introduced in fashion in a way to be adopted by the streets why, was the Puma Clyde, 19, mid 70s. And why the Puma Clyde? Because it was named after a basketball player called Clyde Frazier. Now, he was a basketball player, but he was also, I'll say the grandfather of Snoop Doggy Dog. He was the first to rock the pimp look and to really express style you know, on his way to the basketball court. 
But really, the defining moment in sneaker culture comes up in the early 80s with a rap band called, called Run DMC. And what happened with Run DMC is quite exceptional because they love their sneakers. They love this specific shoe, sorry, behind me, called the Superstar, also called the Shell Toe Adidas. You can see the tip of the shoe looks like a shell. And they write a song about that shoe called My Adidas. And they start rocking that song and it catches fire. And they realize that you know, they are helping Adidas to sell millions of, of dollars of shoes. So they go on scene in Madison Square Garden in New York, 1986, and they invite the executive from Adidas, German shoe company, extremely conservative, to the show. And now there's 15,000 kids in the audience, and at some point DJ Run takes off his shoe, shows it to the crowd and said, show me, show me your shoes. And everyone, as they were singing my Adidas, and everyone pulls up an Adidas, and, Adidas, and the executive from Adidas are baffled. Make a long story short, Run DMC and Adidas strikes gold. Run DMC make hundreds of millions of dollars for Adidas as Adidas signed with them the first sneaker endorsement contract ever for musicians. But what they did is they created a monster. They opened the door of hip hop to sneaker companies. So following Run DMC's footstep, pretty much every rapper jumps on a bandwagon. Fresh Gordon comes up with my fillers. Heavy D praised Nike. Busy B endorsed Converse. Beastie Boys exposed Adidas to the punk rock audience. Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince play the cock sportif. And L Cool J becomes the official trooper for troops. And now pretty much every brand and rapper raises the stakes, going from a culture to a cult, until a new, bold and black superhero shows up right here in the city of Chicago. <laughs> now, the Air Jordan 1 was a real turn in, in sneaker culture. Couple of reasons, more than a couple of reasons, but let's say the two main reasons. One, it was a basketball shoe, literally embodied by Michael Jordan, but Nike had Spike Lee, who was an urban legend, already an urban legend, direct the entire communication process, and Spike introduced the duo, Michael Jordan, Mars Blackman. He played Mars Blackman. I don't know if you remember those, those ads, might, you know, from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the 90s, incredible. The other thing that, and so as a result, the Air Jordan became instantly a staple of, of street culture. The other thing that Nike did, which was a revolution back then, is they introduced the series concept. Now you had a new Air Jordan every season. You know, a little bit like if Christian Louboutin was, you know, hitting you every season, <laughs> which he does. <laughs> now, the shoe that really beat it all is this shoe. It's called the Air Force One. And why is it the top shoe of all times? Well, in a nutshell, it is the best selling shoe in history. Let me give you a you know, couple pointers. One is the Air Force One, this shoe, the white on white, in 2002, sold for 15 million pairs in the US. 15 million pairs of that shoe sold in the US versus 250,000 pairs of Air Jordan. How did it get there? Because it is the shoe that every single rapper wore in their videos. Now, why did rappers and hip hop adopted that shoe? Well, that shoe comes from Harlem. And it was adopted by the streets as the shoe, as the street hustler's shoe of choice. It was the drug dealer's shoe. It was the badass shoe, as we say. <laughs> and so, if you're a rapper and you're becoming famous and you're on TV and you're in music videos and you're looking for legitimacy and a connection with your public, you're gonna choose visual codes. And so they pick up that shoe as the sign that they were legit. Second thing is, hip hop moguls started to wear that shoe only once as the symbol of their newly, uh, newly acquired fortune. And so the result was that a shoe that Nike invested no marketing dollars in in 30 years became the top selling shoe in history. Interestingly, Nike will tell you that it has nothing to do with streets, Nothing to do with fashion, it's all about performance. <laughs> now in a nutshell, hip hop became the global dominant youth culture over the last 30 years, and sneakers flew on the feet of rappers across the world and created a $30 billion industry. 
of which 80% comes from lifestyle, in plain English, hip hop and street culture, and 20% from, play, from playing sports. Now, guys in sneakers, nothing compared to women in shoes. <laughs> Here's a few facts to back it up. American women were, buy two to three pairs a year on average, which represents 65% of the market. Now that's 50% more than men and, kid put, and kids put together, which makes you ladies the undisputed world champion. <laughs> Why? Well, here's where it gets into interesting. There's, there's several sets of reasons. First, I would call the amazing transformative power of high heel shoes. When you step into a pair of high heels, your leg goes into tension. It appears more muscular, prettier, and you appear taller and thinner. Next, it increases your silhouette 25% each way, and I'll show you how in a second. But as a result, it changes your balance and forces a much more sensual look, walk. <laughs> this is real. Now, physical transformation then intersects with psychological impact. Now, there's many different theories, but really three that I've retained for this presentation. Interestingly, they're all different, but they all point to the same place. The Cognitive Behavior School will tell you that it is the look of men, the way men look at women, that flatters a woman and makes the woman want to buy more shoes. Okay. Freud, Sigmund, no surprise, you know where it's, where it's going, will tell you that the foot is the missing penis in a woman. <laughs> and so what happens when you slip into a pair of shoes? You mimic the sexual act, of course. <laughs> right. Now, the theory that I like, I like the best, because I can't really verify it, uh, is, the, is a neurological theory which claims that in the cerebral cortex, the front part of the brain, the sensory, the area that matches the sense, sensory area that matches the foot is right next to the sensory area that matches the genitals. And that there is a lot of cross-talking, sometimes it overlaps, there is a lot of cross-talking between these two. And so it would tell you that foot or shoe equal sex. Um, that might be why foot and shoe are number one in the obsession and fetish list. That's a fact. My take, okay, it probably has to do with, um, more to do with empowering women and the image of the modern woman in pop culture. And so let's talk about pop culture for a second because to me it's really the intersection of pop culture and all those reasons that created the high heel culture and the obsession of a lot of women for high heel shoes. The flappers, 1920s. Liberated woman, smoking in public, drinking in public, dr treating sex casually, wearing high heels. In the 30s, there's another icon that stepped on stage, on the big screen, Betty Boop. And what is she wearing? Tight dress, short dress, and high heels. All right, Betty. <laughs> in the 40s, during the war, interestingly, there's a dichotomy between the modern yet tough image of women, we can do it, and the image that at the same time, men's having their barracks across the ocean. What they're fantasizing about are pinups, totally different images. What are pinups? Very sexy images of women wearing high heels. Interestingly, right after the war, it's that second image that, quote unquote, prevails. And at the same time, a huge technological advance, the stiletto, is a tremendous breakthrough. Two things about the stiletto. As all of you know, stiletto means sharp, sharp knife, small dagger in Italian. But what it is, it's the, it is the insertion of a piece of metal in the heel 
that allows high heels to go much higher without the fear of breaking or you know, ending up in a, in, a, in a catastrophe. And that single-handedly changed shoe culture for women forever. Silodo was immediately adopted by Hollywood, Marilyn Monroe, and it became the symbol of the new liberated, sensual, desirable woman. At the same time, another icon appeared on the scene, <laughs> Barbie, whose feet I shaped to wear only high heels. And as you know, Barbie is probably the first exposure of most little girls on the planet to beauty and fashion. But it's really in the 90s with television and Sex and the City that high heels came out of the closet, so to speak. Three things happened with that show. One, it made official the link between seduction, sensuality, and high heels. Two, it made it okay for women to obsess about shoes in public. <laughs> and three, it took high-end high designers out of the closet and made them stars. Shoe cobblers became stars. Now, the high heel culture now, where are we? Well, interestingly, and that's my take on it, a lot of the fetish codes and sexual codes of the 70s and the 80s are in most of you know, high heel shoes today. Uh, patent leather, very thin high heel, ankle strap. Back in the 70s, mid 70s, you would only see those in fetish clubs or in strip clubs. Now they're pretty much everywhere. So that's an interesting factor. Shoe cobblers, as I was saying, became stars. The Christian Louboutin, Manolo Blahnik, Pierre Ardis of the world have become household names. And even though their share of the market is not huge, they are the one driving the entire industry and the trends of a $33 billion market. Finally, which shoe are you? Well, I hope you understand now that, or you know a little bit more now that, you know, shoe culture defines you a bit more than it would seem at first. When you pick your next pair of shoes, whether it's in a store or in your closet tomorrow morning, just ask yourself, what message am I sending? Be conscious, what I would say, occupy your shoes. Be responsible for what you wear. And finally, please take action. I'd like to go back to the first point I made. If shoes were made for walking, you would have 50 pair of legs. <laughs> but there are people out there, here in Chicago, who don't have enough money to put new shoes on their feet. There are charities, and I had lunch with a lady today, uh, who heads a charity called Shoe Heels, the charities which only goal is to put new shoes on people's feet, people, who, people in need. So please reach out and take action, do something about it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.